All right, so we're going to get into some microbiology, talking about microscopic organisms, uh, specifically viruses and bacteria. So the nature of viruses is that um, they all have the same basic structure, which is much more simple than the cells which we have been looking at up to this point. They are composed of a nucleic acid core, which is either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protein uh, capsid. And within that capsid, they do not have cytoplasm, so they don't have um, the fluid filled with you know, nutrients and waste products, um, because it doesn't need that, because it um, hijacks cells and that's how it survives, so to speak. So um, the DNA or RNA also has some variability in it. It can be either circular or DNA or linear. It can be single or double-stranded. Double and it may have segments uh, to it, or it may just be one complete <coughs> um, nucleic acid strand. Um, and there are different ways to classify our viruses, um, sometimes by their genome itself, but also we can talk about um, how they behave, so whether or not they are retroviruses. So we'll talk more about um, the different ways that they are classified. Um, one of the ways, of course, that most things are being first classified is through their structural appearance. Um, most viruses come in two simple shapes, either helical or this 12-sided um, icosahedral ball. Well, it looks like a ball, but it actually has many sides to it. Um, but some viruses have more complex shapes, such as T-even bacteriophages, which are kind of shaped like a T. And they are binal symmetrical, which means they have a head and a tail portion. Um, some viruses are even enveloped and have many different states. Um, pox viruses are another example of a complex uh, morphology of a virus, and they can come in many different um, shapes as well, but have multiple layers within their capsid or protein layer. They come in many different sizes, but are generally always larger than our macromolecules, such as a large protein, such as hemoglobin, um, <clears throat> but are approaching the same size as some of our smallest bacteria, but not still um, about a fourth of the size. Uh, for our biggest ones. Okay. Um, there is also some terminology when talking about viruses. So a virus, when it's in its active form, it is infecting cells and living within it. When it's outside of this cell, it is called a virion. Nearly all viruses have a protein sheath or capsid and then their nucleic acid core. But some viruses, however, have other things uh, accessory to their um, nucleic acid, including enzymes. One example is reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme which helps um, take RNA and convert it into DNA. Lots of animal viruses also have an envelope, which has a cell membrane, uh, which helps <coughs> the viral proteins infiltrate a cell membrane. Um, all viruses have to have a host. They are obligate intracellular parasites, which means they have to go inside cells in order to reproduce. Um, the host can um, vary, but is generally limited to a few different types of species, and that would be its host range. And even within those species, it has specific tissue tropism, where it can only infect uh, certain parts of an organism say, um, such as a hepatitis virus, which is going to go uh, mostly in the, in the liver. Viruses can also remain dormant or <clears throat> in a, a almost hibern hibernatory state um, for years at a time. So example of this is if you've had chicken pox, um, you may get shingles, which is the same virus. It doesn't present itself exactly the same uh, presents itself as blisters, which are um, uh, painful, 
And this is shingles uh, if it occurs later in your life. There are more kinds of viruses than organisms, which makes sense because they are much smaller. They have to um, infect different types of organisms. So one organism can have many different types of viruses that it is infected by. Um, so the way a virus replicates um, is simply by hijacking their, their host cell and then inserting its nucleic acid which acts as instructions to make more viruses. So there are some instructions, you know, on the DNA or RNA, um, which um, have to be, in a way, tricking the um, host cell to use them, to translate um, them into proteins. Again, outside of a cell, they are called a virion, and they can only reproduce inside the cells. So viral genomes can not only be classified as the nucleic acid, whether it's DNA and RNA, but also in the number of strands. Most RNA viruses are single-stranded, and they are replicated in the cytoplasm. So they don't have to go to the nucleus because they're already RNA, and they only need the process of translation. These also have a high incidence of mutation because it's not going through um, the rigorous process of um, checking for uh, errors in replication in the DNA or in transcription. Um, and then there are, like I said, retroviruses which use the enzyme reverse transcript, transcriptase to transcribe viral DNA, RNA, into DNA. Most DNA viruses, however, are double-stranded, and they are replicated in the nucleus of the eukaryotic host cell. Um, <clears throat> some viruses, um, which are currently um, found in increasing number in humans, uh, can be called emerging viruses. Um, and, well, they don't doesn't necessarily have to be humans. It can be emerging in other um, types of, of animals as well. Um, they're often deadly to a new host. So for example, like the swine flu a few years back was an emerging disease um, that originated within <coughs> different species such as pigs. Um, but when it's first introduced into a human population, it will, it will be very um, deadly because the humans don't have a their immune system adapted to it yet. Um, and it has become, uh, these have become a considerable threat in the aviation age, or really this globalization age where you can travel throughout the world, pick up a virus, and then go somewhere else and, and transmit it there. One example of an emerging virus is called hantavirus, which causes a deadly pneumonia, so it infects the lungs. And its natural host is deer mice, and it can be um, transmitted through fecal and urine matter. Um, so if a deer mouse with the virus um, is living in a house and it has a lot of droppings there, that virus can then be uh, transmitted when the person finds it and starts to clean it up. Very rare disease. Um, but one that is also very deadly. Another couple that you have heard of and made uh, rounds in the news a few years ago are Ebola virus, which causes a severe hemorrhagic fever, um, mainly because uh, the immune system doesn't know how to handle the virus and it kind of freaks out and then you waste, you waste, um, basically waste away your body trying to, trying to fight the disease and your immune system goes into a hypersensitive um, shock, so to speak. Um, it is among the most lethal infectious diseases, so it kills, I think, up to 50% of its host, and depending on the different strain, many of them will have different um, uh, lethality of, of people. The host, however, where it comes from is unknown, but does seem to be from eating bushmeat in Africa, uh, generally thought to be fruit bats. 
SARS is another virus, severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by a coronavirus. Its host is a civet, which is uh, kind of like a weasel or mongoose. And it has a very low mo mutation rate compared to HIV and other viruses. Um, and there's a vaccine currently being developed, but it also is deadly, not as deadly as Ebola. Okay, so that's it for viruses. Now we're going to talk about bacteria, which comprise our um, prokaryotic organisms. Prokaryotes are the oldest, structurally simplest, and most abundant um, types of life in the earth. And they have been abundant for over a billion years before eukaryotes showed on the scene. 90 to 99% are unknown and or undescribed. And they fall into our two domains, uh, bacteria, or also called eubacteria, or archaea, or also called archaea bacteria. Many archaeans are extremophiles, which means they live in extreme environments, such as in hydrothermal vents or in geysers. Um, and um, there are structural differences between the two. So bacteria have lipids that are unbranched and used ester bonds. And archaea have lipids that are branched or use uh, ether bonds. And this is found in their uh, plasma membrane. Bacteria are found er in every environment except extremophilic environments, whereas archaea are more adapted to the extremophilic temperatures. Um, bacteria also have a cell wall with peptidoglycan. Um, their DNA replication is unique. Both of them have a single replication of origin and the transcription and translation process are also unique in bacteria. Whereas in archaea they don't have peptidoglycan, their DNA replication is more similar to eukaryotes and so is translation and transcription. Alright, we talked about the phylogeny of life using the three domains. Um, there's evidence that shows the archaea and eukaryote are actually more closely related than archaea and bacteria. but um, morphologically, it's easier to lump them together. So, the archaea and bacteria would be um, either a paraphyletic or poly polyphyletic grouping. Alright, other ways in which we classify bacteria, we can um, look at their membranes, whether they are photosynthetic or non-photosynthetic. Um, so, they were the first organisms to go through photosynthesis. They can be able to move on their own or motile or non-motile or they are just stationary. They can have uh, unicellular um, <coughs> beha behaviors or they can form colonies or they can be filamentous so they can have like long strings. They can form spores or just be um, reproduced through binary fission. Um, and their importance as human pathogens or not are also ways in which we classify them. Other ways we classify them, again, are, are the structurally how they are shaped and how they aggregate. So different, the basic shapes are Bacillus, Coccus, Spirillum, and Vibrio, which is common shaped. But this is, these aren't the only shapes, these are just the most common used. And the aggregations, if you have two of them together, that would be a, a, a dye. Um, aggregation, so diplococci is two um, coccus-shaped bacteria. Um, you can have uh, streptococci, which is a string, and um, staphylococci, which is a cluster. And then you can do the same thing with the other shapes as well. Another way we can differentiate them is through gram staining, which we did in lab already. Um, peptidoglycan forms this rigid network in the cell wall, helps maintain the shape and um, keeps it safe in hypotonic environments. Um, archaea have a similar example, although it's not the same. Gram-positive bacteria have a thicker peptidoglycan wall, which makes them appear purple in the staining process. Gram-negative um, contain less peptidoglycan, so they do not retain um, the gram's iodine. Um, and so if you didn't do, you could just do a gram stain and um, all the gram-positive would be um, 
crystal violet and then you wash away the gram negative with alcohol but it sticks to the gram positive um, we only use saffronin as a counter stain so anything that's not purple will uh, stain saffronin so that you can see the difference between the two and so here we have gram positive and gram negative bacteria um, together in a slide there are other structures which also help to identify um, different types of bacteria there's an S layer, which is a rigid crystal structure found on the outside of the peptidoglycan layer, which is usually for sticking together to either uh, you know, another organism or um, a part of an organism or other bacteria. Capsules can also form, which form a gelatinous layer, which also can help protect the bacteria and um, keep it from being attacked by an immune system. Finally, pili, which are not cilia, these aren't used for movement, but they are used to connect different bacteria to allow them to have a exchange of DNA in a process called conjugation. Another one, endospores, which is like a secondary layer, a thick wall which develops around the bacteria, which allows it to go into a, um, a, a, um, state of, I want to use animal terms like hibernation or torpor, but that's not correct, but a, a, a state in which they can um, activate later. So it usually happens under harsh conditions where it's too cold or too hot. They form this uh, endospore um, until conditions become favorable layer, later. Um, the bacteria that cause tetanus, botulism, and anthrax have a capsule or yeah, have this endospore layer on them and that's also what makes them very um, virulent or dangerous or lethal um, because they can for form these endospores. Prokaryotes often also have these invaginational layers here um, with complex membranes um, and these represent you know the beginnings of uh, photosynthetic areas or also um, is thought to have uh, contributed to the formation of the nucleus and other eukaryotic um, organelles. Alright, so a few bacterial diseases we'll talk about first is tuberculosis, which was a very infectious disease which killed a lot of people for many years, um, and it afflicts the respiratory system and kills the immune system and is even easily transferred from person to person through the air. So it causes people to cough and that saliva and mucus which goes into the air can easily be transmitted to another person. Recently we have experienced multi-drug resistant strains and an increase in the incidence of tuberculosis. Um, it isn't a big problem in the United States and most developed countries, but it is a much bigger problem in less developed countries. 